This presentation will examine independent invention and world religions. Independent invention is when an idea or a material evolves between similar cultures with little to no interaction with one another. The first important note to discuss is definitions in order to lay the groundwork for what we'll be analyzing today. So to start, as you can see, I've laid out the definition of independent invention at the very bottom where it is written when two similar ideas or materials evolve independently from one another. But I've also made distinctions of the types of categories we'll be looking at. The first category is religion, and religion is defined as a belief and worship of a superhuman controlling power. The next is the definition of myths, which is something we'll be looking at, stories with religious undertones. And finally, legends, stories with pseudo-historical basis to it. It is imperative to note that mythology is a major component of religion, but religions only become mythologies when the worshipping practice dies off, leaving only the mythological narrative behind. Next, we'll have to set the stage of where we're going to be looking at today. First, we're going to be looking at Mesopotamia. We're going to look at Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian mythology. Then we'll look at ancient Greece for Greek mythology. Then we'll go to the kingdoms of Israel and Judah for the Christian and Jewish religions. Then we'll go to India for Hinduism. And then Mesoamerica for both Maya and Aztec mythology. And finally, South America for Inca mythology. Some important texts to note include the Popol Vuh, a Mayan text, the Codex Bourgeois, an Aztec codex, Hesiod's Theogony and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which are Greek texts, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Atrahasis, the Enuma Elish, and Ishtar's Descent into the Underworld, which are Mesopotamian texts, the Bible and the Tanakh, which are Judeo-Christian texts, the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, and Rig Veda, which are Hindu, Hindu texts. So first, let's go over the story archetypes that are present in these mythologies alike. There are six archetypes that we are going to be looking at today. The first of which is creation, which is rather self-explanatory. Next are deluge myths, which are great flood myths. Next is the hero's journey story, which is a rather popular story throughout the world. Then a myth related to paradise, whether it be losing it or a journey to it. A myth related to the underworld or a penance myth. And finally, a chaos comp myth which is a myth where a deity is battling a great world-ending beast. So we'll start with Mesopotamian mythology. For the creation story, the Enuma Elish is the example we'll be looking at, which is the Babylonian epic of creation that establishes the creation of the universe by the water deities Apsu and Tiamat and Marduk's ascension to the status as the head god of the, pa the pantheon and the creation of the world of man. Next is the deluge myth, the Atrahasis, or the deluge of Utnapishtim in the Gilgamesh epic. These are the same narrative, practically, with names only being swapped out. This is the flood myth that we're going to be looking at, where the god Enki, or Ea in the Gilgamesh epic, relates to the main hero of the story Atrahasis, or Utnapishtim in Gilgamesh, about the flood that the god Enlil was preparing in order to wipe out humanity, imploring him to build an ark. With his family and animals on board, Atrasis survives the flood and was blessed by the other gods, with the exception of Enlil, who was enraged that he survived after he had sacrificed them. Uh, after he had sacrificed to them, following the recession of the waters. The next myth we're going to be looking at is the hero's journey motif, which is, an ex which we will look at the epic of Gilgamesh for. This is probably one of the utmost examples and definitely the oldest example of the hero's journey in, in literary terms, and it follows the hero king of Uruk, Gilgamesh, as he fights a bunch of demons and beasts, such as Humbaba the demon or the bull of heaven respectively, as Gilgamesh searches for immortality. Next is paradise, the paradise motif, which is noted in the Epic of Gilgamesh actually, uh, in regards to the Garden of the Gods where Gilgamesh meets the goddess Siduri, who points him in the direction of Utnapishtim in order to help his quest for immortality. 
The next myth is the underworld myth, and the best example of this one is the descent of Ishtar, or Inanna, depending on which source you're looking at. Uh, and this details the goddess Ishtar's descent to conquer the queenship of the underworld from her sister, Ershkigal, Ershkigal, wherein she was killed, but then escorted out of the underworld on behalf of the god Enki. And finally, there's the Chaos Kampf, uh, which again, the Enuma Elish is a very good example of, uh, because the climax of the Enuma Elish has Marduk fighting with the water goddess Tiamat, who is portrayed as bestial um, and a goddess of salt water, um, and slaying both her and her bestial offsprings. Next is Greek mythology. Uh, the, creation, the best creation myth comes from Hesiod's Theogony. Uh, the entire book, the entire poem, I should say, uh, is actually a creation myth, and it opens with nothing from K the the god deity Chaos, uh, who gave birth to Gaia, the Earth, Tartarus, basically Hell, Nyx, the Night, Erebos, the primordial being of death, and Eros, the primordial being of love. Uh, from Gaia was born Uranos, Heaven. Uh, to be her consort, as well as Pontus, the primordial ocean, setting the stage for all of Greek mythology. Next is the Deluge myth, uh, which is noted in the Deluge of De Decalion and Pyra. Uh, and this notes a Deluge sent by Zeus to wipe out the wicked of humanity, uh, sparing only Decalion and Pyra, who were forewarned by the Titan Prometheus, who is their father, uh, to build a chest and stow away until the flood subsides. The hero's journey can be indicated by one of two stories, uh, the Iliad by Homer, which follows the story of the Achaean Greeks as they siege the city of Troy, primarily focusing on the rage of Achilles throughout the narrative. Or you could also look at the Odyssey, which follows the travels of Odysseus, a hero of the Trojan War, as he makes his way home despite constant divine interference preventing him from doing so. Next is the idea of paradise, um, and the best example of this is the Golden Age of Greece, uh, which can be found in Hesiod's Works and Days poem. Uh, during the Golden Age of Greece, men were happy and lived in peace with the world, uh, living very long lives with no tribulation or strife in a paradise-like world, rather similar to the idea of the Garden of Eden in the Bible. Next is the underworld myth, um, and one that comes to mind is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, the story of two lovers. Orpheus travels to the underworld to beseech King Hades and Queen Persephone, the king and queen of the dead, to return his lover to him. And this is a request that is granted by Hades on the, on the notion that Hades forces Orpheus to promise him that he can lead Eurydice out of the underworld, but if he turns back to look at her, she has to stay. Um, and unfortunately, that does not work out in their favor. And finally, the Chaos Kampf. Um, in Hesiod's Theogony, he makes a mention of a great monster named Typhon, who is the son of Gaia and Tartarus, and has the motif as the father of all monsters in ancient Greece, um, who was sent to usurp Zeus for cosmic supremacy. Zeus then buries him under Mount Etna as a result of the fight. Next is the Bible, uh, so Judeo-Christian uh, works. And the creation uh, in, in biblical terms can be found in chapter 1 of Genesis, where it details God creating the heavens and the earths and all the creatures therein. In Genesis 6 through 8, you can find Noah's deluge, where God chooses Noah to build an ark and take his family and the animals onto it and ride out the coming flood that he was sending to wipe out humanity's wickedness. Uh, after the water subsides, Noah sacrifices to God, renewing God's covenant with humanity. There are actually, then there's the hero's journey, which is one of the most prominent hero's journeys, at least in the Bible and the Tanakh, is Moses and the Israelites' exodus from Egypt, where God through Moses brings down ten plagues upon the Egyptians, forcing the Pharaoh to free the Israelite people from captivity. Then there are two forms of paradise uh, regarded in the Bible. The first form is described in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, where the Garden of Eden is a lavish paradise for Adam and Eve to live in, but in chapter 3, the archetype of paradise being lost exists as they are banished after eating the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. The second is, uh, follows the archetype of paradise regained, 
and can be found primarily through the New Testament, wherein the kingdom of heaven is reserved for the righteous people. For example, in Matthew chapter 5, it, they, the authors had written down, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Regarding the underworld, it is spoken throughout the Tanakh and the Bible, with words like Gehenna and Hades frequently appearing in order to make allusions and parables to it. Um, but other, unlike other religious and mythological stories, there are few myths actually regarding the underworld's journey itself. The best example is the harrowing of hell, which is both the, wherein Jesus dis descends to hell and loosens the bonds of those who are chained in hell. And this is described in the Revelation of John, where Christ says, I am the living one, I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death in Hades, as well as in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, in regards to a prophecy of King David, he spoke on the resurrection of the Messiah, saying he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. There's also a chaos conf in the Bible, at least in two places, the first place being Psalm 74, where one of the verses alludes to this chaos comp, where it is written, You crushed the heads of the Leviathan, you gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness, uh, the Leviathan being a draconian sea creature of sorts. And this verse gets expanded upon by the prophet Isaiah, where he writes, On the day the Lord with his cruel and great and strong sword will punish the Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. Next up is Hinduism, um, and the creation that I am looking at is going to be dictated in the Prasna Upanishad, but there are other creation stories in Hinduism, so this is not nearly the only one. Um, this details the creation through a discussion between two sages. Uh, the master sage explains to his pupil that the creator longed for the joy of creating, and through meditation, the beings Rai, which means matter, and Prana, which means life, came into existence and all things sprang from them. The deluge myth occurs in the Sataftha Brahmana, uh, in which there is a deluge myth tied to Vishnu, who saved the human Manu from a flood by telling him to care for a fish and build a ship, wherefore he would fasten the ship to the fish, who had magnified in size after the care, and the fish pulled him to the northern mountains, saving him from the floodwaters. The hero's journey that exists can come through the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which follows the word Arju Arjuna, who is counseled by Krishna, a avatar of Vishnu, uh, before the battle of two warring clans, with Arjuna taking on the hero motif and Krishna taking on a teacher motif, which we'll analyze later in the video. For Paradise, there's not really many myths regarding Paradise that I could find. Um, however, the, the biggest most consequential notion of Hinduism is the release from the cycle of samsara, which is uh, being reincarnated. So the argument can be made that the reward of paradise is escaping the cycle of samsara. Likewise, um, Hinduism does have a lord of the dead named Yama, uh, and as such, the underworld is is mentioned as a result of him having domain over it, uh, yet there's not very many myths, and with how important the idea of release from samsara is, it's not a very big surprise that there's not many myths regarding going to the underworld. And finally, there's the Chaos Kampf, which it can be found in the Rig Veda, uh, as, as a result of Indra sl slaying the snake Vritra, who is his archenemy and is most commonly referred to as a serpentine beast. Now we move on to the Americas, and we'll start with Aztec mythologies. Uh, regarding creation, creation came into existence by the Lord of all existence, who created the universe, the earths, the mountains, the people, the animals, and the stars. Mm -hmm. And this is from the Indian author Fernan del Alva Cortez. Regarding Deluge, you can find a, a example of Deluge in the Five Sons myth, where the fourth son in the myth, Tlaloc, wiped out humanity with a flood. An example of a hero's journey can be seen as Quetzalcoatl journeying to Tlapalan, uh, the land where he came from, um, after the Toltecs decided to turn from him and instead worship, instead and worship Tezcatlipoca. The Paradise one is actually interesting because... Uh, 
regarding warriors of the Aztec Empire, they had be- some had believed that they would service the sun after they had died, where they would be admitted to the dwelling place of the god sharing a feast with him, not at all dissimilar to a uh, Valhalla of sorts in Nordic mythology, hence the term a Mexica Valhalla. Regarding an underworld myth, some of the underworld myths de- depicting the death of Quetzalcoatl actually hold to the notion that he wandered the underworld for eight days before he actually was resurrected. Uh, in regards to Chaos Comp myths, an example would be uh, when Tezcatlipoca had to fight the earth monster Tlautecuti uh, and as a result lost his foot. Next is Maya mythology, and throughout the Popol Vuh they'll refer to themselves as the Quiche people, however they are one and the same. Uh, regarding the creation story, the heart of the sky, also known as Hurricane in the Popol Vuh, and the sovereign plume serpent fashioned the world from chaos and created humans. In regards to a deluge, Hurricane had been irritated with the humans and had flooded the world, destroying humanity as a whole, uh, forcing humanity to be reborn by being carved out of wood. In regards to the hero's journey, there are twin gods in the Popol Vuh named Hunahuapu and Chpalank, who are basically an embodiment of a hero's journey because they perform many feats that we'll even discuss uh, furthermore in this PowerPoint uh, throughout the world and the underworld. Next is the notion of paradise, uh, known as the Bearded Place, which was a mountain where the lords of the Quiche people presided over, uh, and during that time, the, it was relatively peaceful and calm, with no evils or difficulties for the people, very similar to the golden age of Greek mythology. Next is the underworld, uh, Shibalba, which is the place of the underworld where the twins actually journeyed in order to meet the lords of the dead and play them in the ball game. And finally, there's the Chaos Kampf, wherein the twins slay Zipakna, a beast who takes the form primarily of an alligator. And finally, we go to South America to look at Inca mythology. Uh, creation is fashioned Verococha, brought humans from a lake with him, creating the sun and moon and stars as well, and then proceeding to create the emperorship of the Inca, as well as more human beings to go with the ones he had brought from the lake with him. Regarding deluge myths, the the pantheon of Andean and Incan gods uh, flooded the world to get rid of corrupt human beings, whereas two shepherds actually survived this with their flocks of llamas by resi- residing in caves in the Andes Mountains, which increased in size with the rising flood waters. Uh, these two shepherds hid here until the waters subside and then got, gained blessings from the gods as a result. Regarding the hero's journey, Virokocha journeyed around the land teaching humans and working miracles for the people he created, which in turn ties with the paradise motif um, because towards the end of the story, Virokocha decides to depart from his people, promising to send them his messengers to protect and teach his people and usher in a new age, the fable of the second age. Regarding the underworld myth, it's rather interesting because this isn't necessarily about the underworld itself, but about the dead. Um, it was a custom at one point for the dead to actually return after five days of being dead. Um, and this is highlighted in the myth of a resurrected man who, instead of returning on the fifth day, was late and returned on the sixth day. And as a result of this, no individual could ever return from the dead. And finally, there's the Chaos Comp, in which Parika hit Amaru, who is depicted as a two-headed serpent, with a golden staff, thereby slaying the beast. Next, we're going to look at character archetypes, and there's primarily three that we're going to focus on. The hero or hero king archetype, the teacher or wise man archetype, and the legendary progenitor or legendary ancestor archetype. To make this analysis easier, I've put the characters that we're looking at side by side, denoting which type of religion or mythology they've come from in order to make it easier. So to start, the hero archetype, Quetzalcoatl was often depicted as a hero king uh, in his depictions. Uh, Manku Kapak was a legendary Inca king. Uh, Gilgamesh and David are legendary kings of Uruk and Israel, respectively. And Hunhuapu, Shbanke, uh, Heracles, and Arjuna are legendary heroes in each of their mytho- mythologies' rights. 
Next is the teacher character archetype. Mm -hmm. Quetzalcoatl, Verococha, Itzamna, and Oanis are all deities that shared arts, knowledge, and wisdom with their respective peoples, uh, making them fitting to, for this archetype. Chiron, on the other hand, is a legendary teacher of heroes, so rather than teaching the entirety of people, he specifically taught Greek heroes. And Krishna was an advisor of Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, making him a teacher to Krishna's hero. And Jesus Christ was a rabbi or teacher during the time, uh, during the time of his existence. Finally, we have legendary progenitors. Um, Manu is attributed as the first man as a result of him surviving the flood in Hinduism, um, making sense of the reason he would fit this bill. Heracles is actually interesting because it is related to a myth pointed out by Herodotus in his work, The Histories, uh, where he talks about King Leonidas II of Sparta, uh, of the fame of the Battle of Thermopylae, being a descendant of the mythological hero. Uh, there are many options for the biblical protogenitor, but Abraham perhaps fits the bill the best, being the patriarch of the entirety of the Israeli people. Uh, thus, it seemed the most acceptable to pick him. Aztec and Meso the Aztec and Mesopotamian protogenitors are flood survivors, just like Manu was. Um, so it makes sense for them to fit this bill as well. And Inti was a legendary Inca god whom the people claim descendant from. It should be noted that the image for Atrasis is actually just a tablet, Um this is the tablet that the story of the Atrasis was transcribed on because there doesn't seem to be any imagery of this character surviving. Um, and that's likewise for the Aztec imagery as well. This is a codice that refers to the deluge, but beyond that, we don't have images of the characters themselves. Finally, we're going to look at divine archetypes, which include patron deities, agricultural deities, water deities, chthonic or underworld deities, deities of the heaven, dying rising deities, deities of war and destruction, and deities of fertility and love. So these are head or patron deities, um, and they are either the heads of the pantheon of the religion, the patrons of the state, or the creators of the universe. Um, if they are specifically listed as heads, this, is, this would take precedent, as opposed to state patrons who change via city to city, as well as the loosest term being the creator deity. Huitzilopochtli, Inti, Enlil, and Zeus are all heads of their pantheon, hence the they have the highest honor in that regard. Itzamna was a patron of the state. Um, the Tremurti, which is Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma, are a creative trinity almost, as well as Yahweh being the creator deity of the, Bib uh, of the Bible. Next is agricultural deities, and these deities either represent the earth itself, as, for example, Pachamama or Gaia, or they are some aspect of agriculture or shapers of the earth, such as Yahweh, for example. The image of Pachamama is actually interesting because that's not an image of Pachamama herself, but it is an image of Inca cosmology that represents her. Next is the deities of water, or some aspect of water, um, making it rather self-explanatory. Most of these are gods of the ocean or of rivers, with the exception being Yahweh, who is the god of everything, and as such, he kind of has to fit in here. Next are Chthonic deities, which are deities that represent the underworld or death, um, and this is, this is an interesting one because technically Yahweh is the only God in the biblical, in, in the Bible. However, I've chosen Satan here because he is most commonly associated with the underworld or hell in this example. Meanwhile, Hades, Ershkigal, Hunkame, Supe, and Solodl are all deities of the dead, um, Interestingly, I had mentioned Yama earlier, who was the lord of the dead, but he was a human, not a deity. Uh, Buta Butapadi is actually known as the god of ghosts, um, which is interesting 
because he was actually a deity as opposed to Yama, who was a mortal who had died and earned the lordship of the dead. Next are deities of the heavens or the sky. Um, and all of these deities represent the heavens in some regard. And interestingly, and the Mayan one is an alternate spelling of hurricane, but it is the same character. Um, and Anu is represented here by his cuneiform symbol as opposed to an image because there is no surviving images of Anu. Next is the dying rising deity motif. Um, it represents a resurrection motif in which the deity experiences a death and a resurrection of sorts. Um, all of these, the uh, Ishtar, Quetzalcoatl, Hunhapu, um, and Setiavan have all died and been resurrected in some sense of the word. Interestingly, Viracocha is on this list because he had actually been, during the Spanish conquest of Peru, conflated with Jesus Christ, who is the example for the biblical example of this. Um, as such, he has been included. Um, and Persephone, while herself is not necessarily a deity that has died and then been resurrected, her cycle with the seasons of her going into the underworld for some of the seasons to be with her husband Hades and then returning and bringing forth the spring counts as a dying rising motif. Next are deities of war and destruction. Um, and Inti, similar to Yahweh, is on this list as a result because both the Inca and people and Hebrew people use conquest and warfare as a means of appeasing their respective gods in their eyes, um, though they are not technically the gods of war in this regard. Shiva is actually on this list not because he is a god of war. Um, he is actually the most important deity of destruction with the epithet that he has of the destroyer often being associated with him. Ares, Ishtar, Tolhil, and Huitzilopochtli are all deities of war, where war is actually an attribute assigned to them. Finally, we turn to the gods or goddesses of love and fertility. Um, most of these deities on here, with the exception of Yahweh, which should become to be expected at this point, all represent fertility or love in some fashion. Uh, Yahweh is only on here because he is the only deity in in the Bible, thus he, this is something that is attributed to him as well. So to recap, uh, independent invention occurs when more than one location creates similar ideas um, and material despite not really having interaction with one another. So one could argue that, you know, Mes Mesopotamian religion had an influence on Greek religion, had an influence on the Bible, had been influenced by Hinduism. However, these individual these individual religions did not influence the Aztec or the Maya or the Inca who could have influenced one another for all we know. Um, certain story archetypes are important to all cultures around the world. Um, these narratives exist because and share these archetypes because they answer major questions that plague all people. And certain character archetypes exist for the exact same reason. They're universal. All cultures have heroes. All cultures need a deity to protect them and turn to in their times of need. All cultures need an answer for what happens after they die. These are just a few examples of the ideas that are universal among everyone. So hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. I had a lot of fun making it. And have a wonderful day.